Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to the live Q&A with me, Professor Michael Scott. It is the 9th of June. We are well on our way towards the uh, height of summer, the longest day of the year. And uh, I hope you have been well over the last couple of weeks. It's been lovely to see some summer weather, absolutely, getting out there as well, so that we could uh, be enjoy our bit of summertime outside. Um, and uh, hopefully that will continue a long time. Indeed, I hope today that you are sitting watching uh, this uh, broadcast from outside somewhere soaking up a little bit of the sunshine. Um, so it is of course uh, very excitedly a prize week. Yes indeed we have a prize week. So uh, we've been looking back through all the questions that we have been able to answer over the last uh, couple of weeks um, and uh, kind of there have been some absolutely excellent ones and as always it's incredibly difficult to decide which are the best um, and which deserves the prize. Um, but I think this time we are going for the question that had me stuck had us all kind of interesting uh, with our uh, question marks and thinking, oh, that's a really good question. And in fact, which some of you have been digging into the answers of, um, and I will reveal a little bit of that in a second. Yes, of course, I am talking about Rupert Thorpe's question, uh, which was asking about the painting of classical statues. We know they were painted, we know they were all in bright colours, but who painted them? And do we know anything about the people who painted them? Absolutely brilliant question, which got us all thinking and me scratching my head. And indeed, when I asked a number of uh, colleagues at Warwick University when we were talking about this, they were, they were thinking, oh, actually, yeah, that's a really good question. I'm not quite sure that we know much about it um, either, or everyone wanting to dig into it. So thank you, Rupert. That was absolutely brilliant. You win the prize this time for the uh, best question. Um, so do please get in touch via the Facebook page um, or via michaelscottacademic at gmail.com to give us your address so that we can send you either a uh, copy of Ancient World signed and let us know what you want dedicated or if you would prefer something for the younger generation you can have a copy of the Living in Ancient Greece Key Stage 2 and 3 a company book that I wrote again signed uh, or as somebody ordered just the other week I believe a 2021 calendar there is still a couple uh, left and someone in mid-June decided this was the appropriate moment um, to order a calendar so you can have one of those as well if you so desire let us know what you would be after anyway brilliant Rupert so your question got us all thinking and um, we've been doing uh, some digging and particularly can I put uh, thanks out to Latifa Walker who got in touch with some of the results of her research that she's been doing into this question and <coughs> she pointed out that there was some quite interesting things mentioned, particularly in Pliny. Now, I know a number of you were mentioning, I think, Pliny, weren't we? We were kind of zeroing in on this as a probably appropriate source, and particularly Pliny the Elder we're talking about here, uh, and his Natural History, which is a hugely long, rambling text that talks about all sorts of things to do with the ancient world. But around about uh, Book 35, shows you how rambling this text is, he gets on to the subject of painting, um, and particularly Particularly, Latifa points out, he gets onto the subject of encaustic painting. So there were two types of painting in the ancient world. The one in which you mixed colours um, and they went sort of directly on uh, to the wall, and that would be used for wall painting, right? but you didn't necessarily need the colour to bond you know, with the, the, the material, you just needed it to sort of dry onto the, the wall for a wall painting, for example. Um, but the encaustic painting, which actually comes from the Greek to burn in, although there's no burning going on here, encaustic painting is where you mix the pigment, the colour, with molten beeswax, a little bit of tree resin as well thrown in there, and that helps the paint colour to then stick to and soak into a much harder stone um, where it's got to be kind of, um, particularly this is used for uh, painting of sculptures as a type of uh, style of painting. Now, Pliny the Elder, as Latifa pointed out, in book 35, and if you'd like to follow up the reference, book 35, section chapter 40 um, talks about a number of different painters that are known in the ancient world. Uh, people like Polygnotus and Pausias of Sicyon. Pausias of Sicyon was very well known for the encaustic method. Um, but in particular, in book 35, chapter 40, uh, Pliny gets on to talk about Nicias. And uh, now Nicias was a painter 
and it turns out that he seems to have painted statues for Praxiteles. Now, Latifa points out there's also a number of great stories about Nicias. He sounds like he was an awesome guy that I would absolutely love to have at a dinner party. He did sort of very, very odd things, like um, sort of was reluctant to sell his paintings even to Ptolemy I of Egypt, if you can believe it, um, uh, and, and kind of diddled one of the great rulers of the early Hellenistic world, Ptolemy, who'd been one of the generals, was one of the generals of Alexander the Great. Um, so we have uh, Nicias, who's clearly got uh, quite a lot of gumption about him. But this is what Pliny the Elder says uh, in Book 35, Chapter 40. It was this Nicias, with reference to whom Praxiteles... Now, Praxiteles was one of the great sculptors of the late 4th century. And in particular, he's known as for sculpting uh, the Aphrodite of Cnidos, the first fully naked female statue um, in ancient Greece, we think, uh, of the goddess Aphrodite and was renowned for his beautiful forms uh, 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 that he managed to create in marble. So Nicias, with reference to him, Praxiteles, when asked with which of all his works in marble he was best pleased, made the answer those to which Nicias had set his hand. So highly did he esteem the colouring of the artist. So what we seem to infer here is that we actually have the name of a painter who actually painted, and we know the name of the sculptor whose sculptures he painted. So there seems to be a bit of a, while they both had independent careers, Nicias as a painter of wall paintings as well, and uh, Praxiteles obviously as a sculptor in his own right. But they did seem to have come together occasionally as a dynamic duo um, to form the Praxiteles and Nicias sculpture, sculpting and painting gang. Um, and it seems Praxiteles uh, preferred as it says here in Pliny, the sculptures with which Nicias had been responsible for painting. So there we have, uh, we get an answer to who was painting sculptures, seems to have been painters who also did things like painting wall paintings, painted ships, um, painted frescoes, uh, painted uh, sort of uh, funerary portraits on wood. So a painter would work across all of those mediums, may have been a uh, specialist in a particular type of painting, so the encaustic method, um, which could be used on a number of different surfaces, and then seem to have had working relationships with different sculptors um, to be able to uh, turn their beautiful sculptures into the vibrant, colourful artworks of art that we know they were. So, Tifa, thank you very much. And a kind of thank you for all of your contributions on this question. Absolutely brilliant. I'm going to be digging into it a little bit further myself as well. Rupert, thank you again for your question. Absolutely brilliant. Um, and kind of let us know uh, what uh, prize you would like. So there we go. Um, no, Tracy, the Parthenon snag list and the Eric Theon snag list didn't help at all because they go down to just looking at who's going to be responsible for sculpting and pay them. Um, rather than who's going to be painting it. So uh, perhaps we might imagine the fee for actually painting it was sort of uh, part of the fee for sculpting it, and the sculptor brought on with them a painter who then got part of the fee. Perhaps it worked like that. Um, so Latifa, you just missed the bit where we talked about your brilliant research. No, Kai, you do definitely have to catch up and watch. Well done to both of you. So thank you uh, all so much for coming up with uh, that great answer to um, this really, really interesting question. Um, I hope you've all been well. Thank you so much indeed for tuning in. It's lovely to see you all. Uh, and uh, we are getting on with some brand new questions that have come in for us before we'll turn to our news, what's new and what's on uh, around the world. So we had a question from Anton. Antonios uh, Kunavos last time that was answered live. Um, and uh, kind of that is about Archimedes. Any idea for dedicating a broadcast series on him and his inventions? Ah, Antonios, I would love to do a series on Archimedes, not least because I think he gets a very, very, very substandard press, particularly in his hometown of Syracuse in Sicily. Now, some of you may well have had be a bit sick of me today. Uh, 
uh, on uh, the BBC just an hour or so ago, if I'm right in thinking. Yes, uh, on BBC Two, uh, episode one of Sicily was back on at 3.15 to 4.15 p.m. So no, I have not jumped from Sicily uh, to here. Uh, the, any tan, thank you for <laughs> commenting on the tan. Any tan comes from sitting out in the beautiful English uh, uh, countryside over the last week or so, uh, enjoying the summer like I hope you all have been as well. I've managed to get out of the country as much as I would have liked to. Oh, kind of here we are with our green and our amber list. Um, but yes, Sicily episode one was on uh, uh, now. Yes, uh, today, uh, Thursday, the 9th of June, 3.15. And uh, the episode uh, two is on tomorrow at 3.15. Now, you might have been looking at that, that when we spend some time in Syracuse, we talk a little bit in that episode one about Archimedes and the great defence of of the city of Syracuse that he helped to uh, create against the Roman invading forces. And Archimedes, not just useful for jumping out of his bath going, Eureka, I've got it, but actually for de inventing lots of different contraptions to help defend the city, including, as I talked about in the programme, my favourite, the claw, uh, where which was a, a large machine that sort of kind of came over the walls of Syracuse and was able to come down into the sea where the Roman ships uh, we're all lining up trying to lob stuff at the walls of Syracuse and, and literally sort of dropping a massive kind of claw, heavy claw into the ship that would splinter through, go through it and then be able to lift that mechanical hand up and as a result pull the entire ship out of the water a sufficient distance until gravity became too much and it would slap back into the water and break in half. Um, uh, and as a result the, uh, the, the Roman general who was trying to take Syracuse bitterly complained that Archimedes was basically making uh, a complete mess up of his fleet entirely. But Archimedes, and then when the Romans finally got in through a tricky little back door, so, um, so like the Romans, um, supposedly they were so infuriated with Archimedes that when they eventually caught up with him, an individual Roman soldier couldn't resist it uh, and just chopped his head off. So now poor Archimedes, you might think, deserves a lot more recognition. I would agree. Antonios clearly agrees. Um, but today in Syracuse, there's very little that you can see of him. There's an absolutely awful statue of him, modern statue of him that's been put up. But apart from that, and they're one of the great sons of Syracuse, doesn't really seem to be very well represented. So I think he definitely requires a uh, broadcast series all about him. Uh, I think we should get on with that pronto. I think we should all go out to Sicily as soon as it's possible and sit there contemplating uh, Archimedes while we all have some nice pasta um, sitting in the sunshine. So, Antonios, it's over to you. When uh, are we heading out there? Um, and uh, kind of who's willing to uh, hold the camera? Who's willing to do sound? Uh, let's do it. Um, thank you for your question. Uh, we've had a question in also on a very different topic and a very different note from Rebecca Louise, who said another question from her excellent students. They had been learning about the Eleusinian mysteries, about Demeter, Persephone and Hades. And one of your students has been asking why there is so much rape in ancient Greek myth. How do scholars feel about this today? How do they interpret it? Um, and what does it tell us about the role of women, young men, and the ancient Greek understanding of sex and consent? Really interesting question. This is one of the great difficulties, I think, when we try to teach and talk about and discuss and get young people of today interested and excited about um, kind of ancient Greek uh, myths and thus ancient Greek tragedies, comedies, dramas, and retellings, that actually the code um, by which so many of these myths are constructed is so entirely alien to the ways in which we operate today. And I think it's also really important, particularly thinking about the Eleusinian mysteries, and many of you will be familiar with the story here, but effectively uh, Hades kidnaps the daughter of Demeter, Persephone, drags her down into the underworld. A Demeter, um, as a result, goes into mourning. That's why you get autumn, and winter, that's when nothing grows, spring, and summer, uh, in the ancient Greek idea. Um, and the eventual kind of uh, deal that's struck is that Persephone can spend part of the year uh, with Demeter and part of the year down in the underworld with Hades. Now, <coughs> this is not the only example. Um, if we think about Zeus, as we did a little bit uh, in a session or two ago, and we talked about Zeus um, turning into a swan and uh, having his way with uh, the beauties, human beauties uh, of uh, the ancient Greek world. Zeus himself has something like 117 adulterous affairs, many of them bordering on non-consensual sex, um, with, if not fully non-consensual sex, with uh, a number of people across the ancient world, while being married, of course, to long-suffering Hera, who gets her revenge in all sorts of ways, and um, by being 
equally uh, difficult sort of sending, for example, Heracles mad so that he turns around and kills his wife and children. Uh, Heracles being one of the offspring of as one of Zeus's affairs that uh, Hera, Hera, as a result, is very unhappy about. So uh, we have to get our head around not just the issue of rape and non-consensual sex, but actually a whole series of ways of behaving that would for us be uh, and are considered not just tragic, but utterly abhorrent. Um, and this is fundamentally kind of one of the most crucial ideas that we have to hang on to when we're studying the ancient Greek world, that their sense of the world of myth, the world of the divine, the world of history, heroes is has no real conception of the benevolent hero or the always good hero or the benevolent god for that matter and the always good god as so many uh, modern religions do um, and indeed so many modern sets of stories that we surround ourselves do in fact for the ancient greeks um, the divine and the heroic world could be equally set against you as for you could be equally violent and horrific um, as uh, benevolent and helpful um, and that is why kind of the greeks spent so much time trying to make sure in every possible way that they could mainly through bribery that that the, the gods and heroes of the ancient world were on their side. But all of these stories also reflect the code through which they lived their lives. And I think we have to face up to that fact, just as we have to face up to the fact uh, a different part of the spectrum entirely, but you know, ancient Greek democracy in Athens had absolutely no role or use for the voice uh, of women for instance, was based on slavery, for instance. There are all sorts of ways in which ancient Greek society was um, not anything like um, a society we would want to be associated with or find ourselves in today. And that doesn't apply just to the ancient Greeks, obviously, but it applies to the Romans, it applies to tons of ancient societies around the world. So we have to sort of keep that distance between us in mind at the same time as um, are thinking about some of the ideas that were generated by that society, some of the arguments that were generated by that society, with which we still feel a closeness and a rapport um, as we go through time. <coughs> so, Rebecca, thank you so much indeed for your question. That's absolutely brilliant. Have we got time for one more before we break into uh, the uh, news? Yes, we have. Um, now, ha, ha, now, I might pronounce your name here. Is Jag Patel or Yag Patel? I'm very sorry if I haven't got that name. What are your thoughts uh, about one day, everything in every museum around the world being returned to their country of origin or home? Just a thought. Don't choke on your coffee or anything. <laughs> Thank you so much. This is a great question. Really interesting, really topical at the moment, because obviously this is something that has been in the news in all sorts of guises um, and continually pops up in a number of different guises related to specific uh, pieces of ancient culture um, or indeed to conceptions of what a museum should be for. Um, and particularly about how do we right past wrongs about the ways that certain pieces of culture were acquired and brought to certain certain museums, but equally, uh, what do we do going forward, uh, even with those pieces that were legally, lawfully acquired from other places, should we have, as a result, um, collections of world culture in one place or should you if you return every item to uh, its uh, country of origin or home have to go to every different country in the world to be able to get a sense of world culture um, and, and this is one of the really I think difficult and unanswerable questions I think we should separate it out from questions about what to do with items that have dodgy provenance yeah. Uh, and items that are specifically famous for being uh, sort of, you know, their return demanded. And we all know examples of these. Um, and actually separate that out from the bigger debate about do we want to have, should there be in existence the concept of a world museum whereby you can go and see image things from all the different cultures of the world kept in one place? Or should you only be able to see in English museums, English historical artefacts, French museums? French historical artefacts, uh, and so on, and so on, and so on. Now, obviously, that debate has changed with the uh, the internet of digital museums, virtual uh, galleries, uh, virtual reality, 3D, the ability to have both something online um, that you can see from anywhere in the world, as well as seeing it in the flesh. Uh, but it's an absolutely kind of massive area. And I don't know if there is a kind of perfect solution. Um, but uh, kind of, I don't think we're going to see uh, kind of... It happening any day soon where uh, every item in the world goes back uh, to uh, its uh, country of origin or home. I don't think it's going to happen anytime soon. 
but we need to keep thinking about what we do want museums to be for, what we want museums to be able to display, and how we want that balance of in the flesh and online, in all of its different formats, um, to be able to give us the sorts of experiences of world culture. I think what we can all agree on is that seeing and being exposed to items of world culture from different cultural backgrounds, perspectives, is an extremely important part of our upbringing uh, and our education to enable us to appreciate, value and understand and have empathy with different cultures and different cultural traditions. I think we definitely should push back against the idea that all you need to do if you're British is look at British history and British culture. Um, kind of that, I think, leads us down a very dangerous path indeed. Right, we have to get into uh, some in the news items that have come up. Now, as some of you may have been following from The Guardian, the uh, grand new Greek lexicon that has been uncovered after nearly 20 years of work. Now, this was being worked on uh, in the Cambridge Faculty of Classics when I was there uh, as a uh, PhD student and then as a research fellow. In fact, a number of my colleagues that I went through undergraduate with and wrote, we kind of climbed up to postdoctoral level we're working on this project and it's absolutely fantastic to see it come to fruition the first new Greek lexicon for quite some time indeed um, and I, I love the fact that uh, they've pulled no punches with the ways that they've gone about publicizing uh, its uh, publication uh, and they've talked obviously about the dodgy uh, the dodgy the dodgy words the dodgy vocab um, now kind of uh, there's been some great articles on this in the press um, and Natalie Haynes no doubt has been quoted talking about some of these dodgy words and her, her enjoyment of the way that they have not uh, pulled their punches so kind of if you uh, seek to have a few dodgy ancient Greek verbs at your disposal. Uh, chetso, there we go, is to defecate, is the new translation. Uh, bineo, well, I'll, uh, to F star star K, there you go, um, that's uh, the word. And lykazo, um, well, now in the old dictionary, in very Victorian uh, terms, it was known as to wench. Um, and <laughs> in the modern New Greek Lexicon Dictionary, it has been updated to uh, performing an act uh, that uh, kind of, well, I don't know if I'd mention it. I don't know what age of people are listening out there. You can go and look it up for yourself. Perform uh, an act. Uh, let's leave it at that, shall we? Excellent. So the, there you go. The New Greek Lexicon, of course, it has a myriad of different uses. Absolutely brilliant update translations across the entire board. Um, but the thing they focus in on for the publicity are the dodgy words. Of course they do. Um, and then from the Daily Mail, you may have seen this as well. Rome is now Europe's sinkhole capital. Um, and many of you may remember that when we started with the Invisible Cities project back in 2014, or Invisible Rome was our first uh, series. And uh, one of the places we first went was to a sinkhole that had opened up on the Aventine Hill, uh, which part of a house had fallen into. And then just recently, there's been another one um, that has happened, opened up. Um, this one uh, consumed a Mercedes SUV and a smart car, six meters deep, 20 meters long, in the Torbequatra district. And it's all because of all these ancient underground quarries um, that have, where they've been digging out all this volcanic, beautiful volcanic tufa from under the ground of Rome over the centuries, leaving great big gaping holes underground as a result, which are kind of are not being supported with all the new building on top because people just don't know where they are. They would have a map until there's a big hole that appears. You don't know where it is. Um, and so there are hundreds and hundreds of these things uh, appearing all over Rome. So be careful wherever you walk when you are in Rome. Um, in Turkey, the aqueduct has been discovered that once carried water to Ephesus, which I think is absolutely brilliant, and a magic jar in Athens holding a dismembered chicken, probably used as a curse, has been uncovered. Wow. The finding reveals new ma evidence for how people used magic and the concept of magic is a very real one, particularly for curses. Uh, kind of, it was found beneath the floor of the Agora's classical commercial building um, and it's a dismembered head and lower limbs of a young chicken. Ooh kind of thing that's how to curse people uh, now there you go you need to be able to curse people with uh, an animal that you've done to a little bit like we do actually find examples of kind of voodoo dolls where they've sort of stuck pieces of metal into clay dolls and, and they seem to be part of curses as well along with great cursed texts and cursed tablets in fact i think in a previous session of this q a we have actually indeed done uh, a little session on how learn how to curse in ancient greek um it's all about the verb i bind you must bind 
pin somebody to a fate and then you put that uh, tablet uh, uh, lead tablet into the ground preferably or near a recently deceased corpse to give it real power and potency or kind of clearly a chicken dismembered chicken works just as well and for those of you who happen to be near Bambara Castle, if you're anywhere near, get there now, please, because Indiana Jones is filming there as we speak. Yes, Harrison Ford has been spotted in and around the area. Um, they've closed off Bambara Castle. The entire Indiana Jones movie team have moved in uh, to take over to film some instalments. And before that, um, a Yorkshire railway has also been turned into the set for the next uh, Indiana Jones movie. The North York Moors Railway in Grossmont has been completely taken over for the filming of the project. So please, if you are anywhere nearby, get there, get some snaps and pictures, send them in to the Facebook page so that we can all enjoy um, the joys of the, watching the new Indiana Jones film come into being. I know we all, we all desperately want to see it. Um, right, some announcements about what's on. If you are at a loss next Wednesday, come and join us for the Warwick Classics Network A.G. Leventis Ancient Worlds Day, um, which is for school uh, students from year uh, nine upwards. We'll be doing a series of talks uh, related to the GCSE and A-level syllabuses for Class of Ancient History, for example. Um, and uh, our focus particularly is on expanding horizons. Now, I'm going to be talking about the Battle of Salamis and its impact um, in the early afternoon as a live lecture. And then uh, one of my colleagues, Dr. Elena Giusti, will be talking, doing a live Q&A with our current classic students as well. And then we have a series of pre-recorded videos, over 20 of them, on different aspects of the teaching syllabus that will also be available from that day. Um, so please come and join us next Wednesday the 16th if you can. It'd be lovely to see you. Uh, there's also on the 21st to the 25th of June the British Museum is having a classics week power lessons from ancient Rome and there's going to be an online program of speakers including Mary Beard, Tom Holland, Ian Morris and others um, all relating of course to the recent Nero exhibition. Um, so that looks absolutely brilliant as well. We've already talked about Sicily online today and tomorrow. Um, you can catch up on the Classics for All talk I did on Tuesday evening. That's now on YouTube as well. Podcast, the Battle of Salamis podcast. If you'd like to hear a bit more about the Battle of Salamis podcast I did for You're Dead to Me is also um, uh, available on BBC Sounds as well as a huge range of great podcasts, all of which, of course, we are flagging on um, the YouTube, uh, uh, the Facebook page. So, have we got time for one more question? Yes, I think we have. Um, have I got a hat, says Patricia. Yes, I do, but don't tell anyone. Um, an Indiana Jones hat, I presume you're talking about. Yes, yes, I do. Um, if you're very unfortunate, I might dig out for the Facebook page a uh, previous many, many eons ago photo of me back in 2004, the first time I went to spend a significant amount of time in Athens, the uh, February time when it snowed really, really heavily in Athens just before the Olympics uh, in Athens of that summer. Um, when I did actually go round Athens, I have to admit, wearing my Indiana Jones hat quite a lot and feeling uh, very pleased with myself um, indeed. But uh, uh, maybe if I'm feeling charitable, I'll drag that photo out and you can all have a good laugh at it. We've got time for one more quick question. Right. Did, this is from Memo Muller, did the ancient Greeks and later on the ancient Romans ever stumble across fossils of dinosaurs and prehistoric animals? What were their thoughts about them? Remember, this is an absolutely brilliant question. Yes, they did. And in fact, it's really interesting kind of what they ended up making of these Finds. Now, uh, Adrian Mayer, who's written on the Amazons, for instance, but has also written brilliant books about thinking about this exact topic. Um, and one of the earliest sources that we have is actually uh, Herodotus. So Herodotus talks about the finding of dinosaur bones. Now, they can't conceive of them as dinosaurs. Right? They know that ancient people, uh, animals, people, etc., that have walked in this land before them. They don't quite have this understanding of dinosaurs. So instead, what the ancient Greeks seem to have done is related it to their mythical world and to the mythical stories of heroes and of gods from previous ages. Now, as we all know, the Greeks conceived of their heroes as being more than human, right? So taller than human, bigger than human. And as a result, all these great, enormous fossil bones actually fitted in brilliantly as real evidence 
of these myth stories. Now, don't forget that myth to us today means something that's definitively not a uh, fact, but actually myth, there was no sharp distinction between myth and fact in the ancient world in the same way. And actually the stories, the mythos, the mythoi that were told were the way in which people conceived of that world. Um, and as a result, here was kind of back up to those real myth stories about real heroes. Here were their bones, the giants uh, that had once walked the earth, etc., both in animal and in human form that had been of that age of heroes. So uh, yeah, we hear about that from Herodotus. We hear about it in Plutarch. We hear about it in Strabo. Lots of different ancient writers um, talk about how kind of the finding these things became real life evidence for the great myths and stories of the earth shaking battles of gods, gods and heroes, gods and titans, um, etc. across the landscape before the Greeks themselves and other ancient cultures had come. There we go. Absolutely brilliant. Remember, thank you so much for your question. Now, next time, when are we going to be able to come meet again? We're going to have to wait a couple of weeks, I'm afraid, uh, to the 1st of July. So Thursday, the 1st of July at 5 p.m., I will be here. I hope you can be too. We've got loads more questions to get through, but please do keep sending in your questions in the meantime. Absolutely fascinating and fantastic to have them. Um, you can do that via email, microscottacademic at gmail.com or direct to the Facebook page as always. In the meantime, stay safe, look after yourselves and one another, and I look forward to seeing you again in a couple of weeks. Take care.